Hey, everybody. So uh, this summer, I had the fortune to go to X, which is uh, Google's moonshot factory, uh, the moonshot factory at Alphabet. And this is a place uh, that has worked on problems like cold fusion and hoverboards. Uh, they have designed self-driving cars and drones and contact lenses that you put in a diabetic's uh, eye to measure uh, uh, glucose in their tears. Um, but what I, the project that I was most excited about at X was actually a project about balloons. Um, X has a three-part formula for their moonshots. Uh, part one, it has to be an enormous, enormous problem in the world. Part two, the solution has to be science fiction-y. And part three, the solution has to be feasible. So part one, problem, internet connectivity. Four billion people in the world don't have access to high-speed internet. Part two, how do you solve this problem? Well, you can put satellites in the sky, but those are awfully expensive. You can build a system of cables and towers, but those are also not particularly cost efficient. And it can be very difficult to do this in very mountainous or jungly terrains, like in Peru or in the Himalayas. So they had a solution that sort of fit in the airspace between a tower, a cellular tower, and a satellite. And that solution was balloons. They said we can affix a Wi-Fi system to a balloon, fly it up 70,000 feet in the air, that means twice the altitude uh, of an airplane, and essentially it'll beam down internet. Let's solve this problem. So what they did is they went out to Dinosaur Point in, this, in the uh, Central Valley. They took a Subaru Forester out there. They bought a couple helium balloons. They tied little Wi-Fi devices to them. They lifted them up into the air. They flew up into the stratosphere, slew us through the stratosphere, the Chopapaws, and they drove their Subaru Forester like maniacs through the Central Valley to try to keep track with it as it floated up, 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 and the connection maintained. They had solved their problem. And the designers told me at this point, they thought, well, surely the rest of it has to be easy. After all, these are balloons. It can't be rocket science. And they were right. It's not rocket science. Actually, it's harder. Because rocket science has dedicated rocket scientists who study the problem of rocket science and have done for over 50 years. But there is no dedicated team to studying how to put an internet in the sky, an internet in the sky affixed to a balloon that is floating around the world. And it turns out that a balloon that floats around the world is essentially like an automated vehicle. It is seeking a destination, and no one is driving it. It is essentially a self-driving car that doesn't have a person, it just has a Wi-Fi device. The problem with the stratosphere, however, is that there is no Google Maps for the stratosphere. There are no roads, there are no stop signs, there are no directions. Instead, the stratosphere is so named because of its many strata, or layers, of wind and temperature. So the way that a balloon, it turns out, has to orient itself is that rather than simply get on the highway and drive toward Peru, it instead has to ascend and descend all these strata until it finds the one that the system tells it is pointing toward Lima, and then it rides that sort of metaphorical road toward Lima in the sky, floats along, and then another balloon comes behind it to follow in its track. So they found that, yes, a network of balloons can provide internet to any place on Earth, and indeed they are doing this now in both rural parts of Lima and uh, in post-hurricane Puerto Rico. And the implication of Loon, I think, to me, is that technology, that which we think of as breakthrough technology, is really two separate things. First, you have invention, you have science, you have a scientific breakthrough, a prototype. And second, after invention, you have innovation, the commercialization of that prototype. And today, I think we are really, really obsessed with innovation. We are obsessed with billion-dollar founders and multi-million-dollar engineers out in Silicon Valley, and that's great. They're doing some wonderful, wonderful things. But often the money comes from innovation, and we look and we're so impressed by a leaf that is growing on a tree that was planted long, long ago, and the name for that tree is invention. And that's why the second story that I want to tell today is also about an X. It's about iPhone X, otherwise known as iPhone 10. And because we're in Washington, D.C., and every story has to have the Russians in it, my story is about how the Russians invented iPhone X. And this story begins in 1957, when Sputnik goes up into the sky, the first time any satellite um, emerges uh, uh, north of the, or above the stratosphere. Um, and this completely freaks Dwight Eisenhower out. And Dwight Eisenhower is not a man easily freaked out. This is a man who defeated the Nazis in France and Germany. But he's freaked out, and he says, we need to solve this problem. And so they start ARPA. 
the Advanced Research Projects Agency within the Defense Department. And ARPA comes up with the first prototype for the internet, they come up with modern GPS technology, but eventually the government says, we just want ARPA to focus on defense stuff, so we're going to call it DARPA. And a lot of these engineers who are obsessed with computers and the future of the internet have to leave ARPA and they go out to a little research project attached to Xerox called Xerox Park, the Palo Alto Research Center. And these engineers and scientists at Park essentially invent the modern guts of a computer. They invent the concept that, uh, uh, that the screen should have windows and the cursor should move along a mouse, and as you type on a keyboard, the words should appear on a screen. Everything we consider a part of a modern computer was essentially invented at Xerox Park. And in 1979, a young 24-year-old entrepreneur wants to visit Xerox Park, and he says he wants to be like Charlie Bucket in the Chocolate Factory, he wants to tour around and see what's going on. And he says, I'll give you a million dollars of shares in my burgeoning little company if I can look around this little amusement park that you have for technology. And this 24-year-old is obsessed with what Park has. They've got graphical user interface, they've got windows, and they've got a prototype for a mouse, and he says, I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this and I'm going to build my own machine that operates along just these systems. And that 24-year-old's name was Steve Jobs, and that machine was called the Apple Macintosh, and he eventually, as we all know, went on to invent the iPhone, which is essentially the grandson or granddaughter of the Apple Macintosh. So in many, many ways you could say Sputnik was the great, 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 great grandfather of the iPhone. And the lesson here, very simply, is that we tend to think that uh, breakthrough technology is the result of aha moments, an aha moment, an eureka moment takes one person in one second, but breakthrough technology is much more likely to take many people, a multitude of individuals collaborating over a multitude of seconds. And so when thinking about the science of breakthrough innovation, rather than design for eurekas, we should think about designing for patients. Thank you.